sandy shores, the link between land and sea. Storms, wind, and never-ending wave action keep adding sand to the billions of grains we sink our feet into. In South Africa, sandy beaches are home to more than 500 different species, and it's one of the harshest environments to live in. Beach ecologist Linda Harris has an early start. She's looking for ghost crabs on a public beach just north of Durban. Linda's been studying beaches and their inhabitants for the past eight years and is still going. She's on a mission to find out exactly how this ecosystem and its dependents function. One of the more studied species is the quirky ghost crab. Ghost crabs are scavengers, so they eat a variety of different food sources on the beach. They, their preference is to go for something like fish, which has got a very high protein content, but they also eat whatever washes up, so pieces of seaweed. Uh, they sometimes eat food scraps that people leave behind. Eating makes up a big part of their day. And not knowing where their next meal will come from means they tend to keep finds to themselves. And when the northeasterly wind brings blue bottles, it's a Christmas feast. Next to fish, this source of protein is highly prized and quickly gobbled up. And what you'll also see is them sort of feeding on sand and they're not eating the sand itself, they're eating the microorganisms that are attached to the sand grains. And they often do that in the, in the swash zone where the, the sand is wet. A ghost crab's best defense against predators and oncoming waves is its burrow unless it is strayed too far from familiar surroundings. Then it must try to blend in. Taking juicy finds back to the burrow is also a good method to keep competitors away from loot. Ghost crabs don't like to share. There's, uh, because the food supply is so erratic, they, they, like to, they, well, they have to compete for their food. So if you don't stand up and defend your morsel, then someone else is going to eat it. To have a closer look at these light-footed invertebrates, Linda must first catch them. And a ghost crab's weak spot is dead fish. Okay, we're going to try and catch a crab now. And one of the ways that we can do this is using what we call a pitfall trap. With a bit of bait, we can hopefully lure the crabs and then as they run across the surface of the beach, they'll then fall in the trap. There are 22 different species of ghost crab in the world. In South Africa, we have three. The most common one is Okipodi rideri, with its familiar purple joints. Its cousin, which is not so common, is Okipodi madagascariensis, which is much more orange in color and lacks the purple joints. But one thing both species share is a taste for fish. So when they pick up the smell of something dead, they are eager to inspect. Although this purple-jointed Okipodi rideri is clearly confused from where the smell is coming, while its orange cousin is wasting no time on the free meal. So this crab is Okipodi rideri. Because you can see it's got the purple on its joints. So we've got another customer in this bucket. And oh, hang on. Okay, this is Okipodi madagascariensis. You can see it's a lot more orange than Okipodi rideri, and it also doesn't have the purple joints. And here we can see that this one is a female because the abdomen is a lot wider. So if we put the two next to each other, on the le my left, the Okipodi rideri, this is the male. And on my right, Okipodi madagascariensis is a female. This crab here is the big claw is on the right hand side, so we say that it's right handed. And this madagascariensis, its, it's big claw is on the left hand side, so we say it's left handed. And what's interesting is that they tend to be right hand dominant. And 
it doesn't really make a difference for them. It just means that when they go in and out of their burrows, it would be in that direction. So it's always with the small claw going in first. Although small, those claws can give a nasty pinch. Linda can vouch for it. She wants to make molds of some of the burrows. Let's try and for this, mix she mixes up. good old plaster of Paris to pour down their holes. It's just like being a kid. <laughs> After the mixture is prepared, she needs to get the homeowners out of their holes. And what better way than to lure them out with some sardine? But where there's food and scavengers, there's competition. The plan is to get them far enough from their burrows so that she can close the holes before they return. And this takes patience and a degree in ghost crab ambush tactics. So while the crabs try to get as much of the free meal for themselves, Linda zooms in on one crab far from its burrow, fighting it out in the feeding frenzy. She must make her move now. It's crab against researcher. One for the determined invertebrate, zero for Linda. But this researcher doesn't give up that easily. As soon as the crabs are happily feeding again on their free meal, Linda strikes with a vengeance. She will cast some burrows today. Ghost crabs don't use the same burrow day after day, so the homeless will quickly excavate new holes for themselves, although they seem more preoccupied with looting than neighbors loot. This is our crab burrow. We're going to see if we can cast it. Let's go. By now, the displaced crabs have already dug new burrows. Making new homes is very much part of their daily routine. Okay, so now we wait for it to dry, and then when it's nice and dry, then we'll dig it up. Linda casts two more burrows. The plaster of Paris sets quickly, and after an hour, it's ready for excavation. This plaster of Paris seems to have set nicely, so now we're going to dig up and see what type of burrow this ghost crab has made. Ghost crabs make burrows for, for different reasons, and one of them is to escape predators. One of the other things is that it could also signal to predators where the burrow is, especially if there's a sand mound next to the burrow. Being such a small animal, a ghost crab's burrow is its most important asset. Without it, it doesn't stand a chance against predators, the sea, and the elements. Ghost crabs also make burrows to escape extreme weather events, so both storms and also uh, big temperatures, high temperatures, and they can moderate the temperature at which they, the temperature range that they experience based on how deep the burrows are. And ghost crab burrows can be up to a meter deep and can be quite long. Even the smallest of these critters know how to make burrows as their lives depend on it. I think I might be able to pull it out. Yeah, there we go. And we can see from how narrow this burrow is that it was from quite a small crab. So I'm not surprised that it's quite short because the, the depth of the burrow is normally related to the size of the ghost crab. I'm 
not entirely convinced that we've done this one very well because it ends quite abruptly and it should either taper to a point or come to a, to a chamber. As you can see, it's from a much bigger ghost crab, if we compare to one of the smaller ones, you can see the difference. And every burrow resembles one of about six letters in our alphabet. This is also an I-shaped burrow, so it's just straight down. You can get a number of other different shapes. So it might be a J-shaped burrow, might be a U-shaped burrow, might be a Y-shaped burrow, or the S-shaped burrow. The only time that the ghost crabs will make S-shaped burrows are for, for mating. And not all ghost crabs mate in burrows. Some of them mate on the surface of the beach. But species like Ocupodi serratothalma, they mate inside the burrows. The S-shaped burrows are associated with big mounds. These invertebrates clearly show us that size does matter. You will see that that burrow entrance can be up to maybe 14, 14 15 centimeters. So it's quite, it's quite wide. And then there'll be a big mound of sand. It looks like a molehill on the beach. Um, and that will be the, the ghost crab burrow. And they use that mound as a way for them to signal to females that there's a, a male um, who's, who's ready for mating. And I don't know, I guess the bigger the mound, <laughs> the better the ghost crab. <laughs> but ghost crabs aren't just fun to watch. As cleaners of beaches, they fulfill an important niche. Ghost crabs have got so much personality. It's almost like a mascot um, for sandy beaches. And I think ghost crabs are, are special like that because it, it, it gives a, almost a face to the ecosystem and it allows us to build a relationship um, with beaches as an ecosystem. So when we talk about conservation and the need to conserve beaches, we don't just think of that being a silly concept because it's, it's just sand and water, why would we want to conserve it? But it's suddenly a, it's a, it's a habitat, it's something that's living. It's a habitat for a species that, um, that we want to protect.